All right, we're back for the Osceola Tailgate, FSU Clemson version of the Osceola Tailgate, and I am joined by the usual cast of characters, uh, Osceola football analyst and former FSU center and guard and tackle, Mark Salva, uh, Osceola recruiting analyst, Charles Fish Fishbein, and FSU alum and Tampa Bay Area Sports Talk radio show host, J.P. Peterson. Welcome, guys. What's up? It's, it's, Welcome. It's hard to believe we're already at week seven of the college football season, but uh, we, we are. And, of course, uh, you know, FSU plays Clemson this weekend. But I wanna, before we get started, I just kind of want to go back to uh, ask you each uh, for your final thought on the NC State game after having a week to marinate over it and what your thoughts are on FSU at 4-2 um, at the midway point of the season versus what you expected coming into the season. So, uh, Mark, we'll start with you. Yeah. Um, NC State for me is real simple. It was a missed opportunity. They were primed, ready for an upset. We had numerous opportunities, even towards the end. And I understand that, you know, there were a lot of mistakes leading up to that point, but we still, at the very end, had a chance to win the game and, and didn't do it. Um, it still leaves a bad taste in my mouth on that one. Um and it will. So it is what it is. Um, we, we rehashed it on Sunday, and I don't care to really – I just want to put that one to bed, honestly. <laughs> no, let's, let's move Let's move forward. Um, right, well, give me your thoughts on the 4-2 and two start versus on what you expected coming into the season. Yeah. So, yeah, you know what? Um, I was hopeful to be 4-2. and two. So um, I think uh, we're – I'm right where I hope to be. I, I was thinking, you know, 4-3. and three, um, would be good. So I guess you can say, I feel like we're ahead of where I thought we would be. Um, so that's a good thing. Um, you know, so I think the moving forward, the, the prospects are good. I think, you know, we, I think we're pleasantly surprised about a lot of things. Um, not the least of which is the way Jordan Travis has played up to this point, regardless of how he, regardless of how he played, uh, Saturday night, he still, you know, at least in the first half, he was really good still, and he didn't get a lot of help that game. But leading up to that point, he was elite. I mean, he was. He was putting balls in great spots. He was really leading the team. Um, you know, we, we found out Tate Rodemaker can play. We, um, you know, we got the offensive line has been better, you know, still lots of room for improvement. Um, you know, defensively, I've been pleasantly surprised. I mean, I you know, the linebackers, I think, have made a huge difference this season in our defense. Um, that second level in, in the tackling has been so much better. So improvement there um, on defense. So, I, you know, look, they're much better than they than – we, we're much better than we have been. Um, I think this is a, so far a successful campaign. Um, it's going to be interesting to see these next six games. Anyway, we got our big rivalry games coming up. I'm really looking forward to that. Um and then a big game, of course, with Clemson this week. So lots to play for. Uh, we're better. I feel hopeful. I think we can beat any team on our schedule if we play up to our full potential. Anything less than that, and we're going to struggle. And that's just the bottom line. JP, your thoughts on the NC, final thought on the NC State game and then halfway point of the season. Season. Yeah, I, I unfortunately did not get to rehash all my frustrations from that game with you guys on Sunday. So uh, um, I'll just JP, say this. You got us? Yeah, yeah, you got me? Yeah, I got you. You got me? Um, yep. Pat, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I didn't get to rehash that with you guys on, on Sunday. Um, I would love to get my frustrations out. But, uh, you know, it, it was very disappointing. I, I, I agree with you guys. There's too many opportunities to win that game. And I really felt like the coaching let us down. I thought Jordan let us down. Um, I just thought, you know, again, the officials let us down again. Uh, what's new at NC State, right? Uh, it, there's a lot of things that the last two games that were are problematic for me is that we, we did things – that we didn't do in the first four games. And I'm not talking about physically. Um, I'm talking about mentally and where you should be getting better as the season goes along mentally and emotionally getting used to big games. We seem to have regressed to some panic coaching, some panic moves. Um, like we're not used to playing in big games. Uh, I didn't see that in LSU. I didn't see that in Louisville. I, but this was, 
you know, this was a little bit disturbing. Um, and I hope that trend does not continue because I think this team is good enough to beat Clemson, you know, maybe three out of 10 times. Clemson is the better team. We'll get into that in a minute uh, I, over overall, but uh, that was a that was a missed opportunity. And, but, you know, we've seen some really good teams go up to NC State and have that same thing happen. So I'm pleased at the four and two start. I think it, it, that's a hopeful one. I, I You know, we could easily have been three and three. This is a, a huge improvement over what this team has been the last three or four years. I think we we can't lose sight of that. Um, but uh, again, that, that I, I applaud Mike Norvell for not settling for the field goal at the end there. I think it was the right play to try and score a touchdown. But the play that they called was way too risky, way too risky, um, did not leave Jordan a run pass option. Uh, you know, it just, it's not on a second down in that situation. It's a bad call. It's bad execution. Everybody failed us on that one. So um, you pick it up and you say, look, we had a 17, three lead at NC state. That's good. Now let's go win a football game that maybe we're the, we're obviously the underdogs. We play smart. We don't make big mistakes and get a couple of big plays in the passing game. We can win this football game. So let's go. Let's go forward and see if we can beat Clemson. Fish, your thoughts on the NC State game to close it out? And uh, yeah, I mean, the, the the craziest thing is if you had told me, I, I would have called you guys at halftime and told you at seventeen three, the way NC State was playing, and the way FSU. You know, you look at how FSU closed the half with the. I think they scored a touchdown and then they got the ball back again and scored another field goal. It just seemed like they dominated that first half. I, I thought there was no way that NC State could come back and win that game in the second half, especially they couldn't move the ball. They they looked so ineffective, and I thought FSU had controlled all three phases of the game. They got the field goal from the field goal kicker in the first half. I just thought they were going to win the game. It was disappointing from that standpoint because they played so well in the first half. And then the second half comes, they let them come out and score on the first drive, basically march down the field. That was more disappointing to me. And then, you know, NC State has a quarterback come in, can't throw worth a lick. I don't even, he didn't even complete a pass. And they don't, they didn't punish that, that NC State for bringing in a backup. You know, when FG said, that was the most pointing thing is that they didn't close out a team that I felt they had on the ropes and they were just better that night. I don't care what they were going in the game and Florida state was a better team that night and they just didn't close it out. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, as far as NC state game, the only thing I will say is they will be kicking themselves about this game for quite some time. And that was uh play on words or pun was intended. Uh, one field goal uh, attempted more uh, probably gets a win at any point in that game. Uh, so anyway, uh, and then listen, uh, you know, the great thing about this is they are four and two. We're in the middle of a two game losing streak, but they've been in a play uh, or a series or a possession of winning either of those two games to JP's point could have gone the other way at LSU. It didn't. Uh, but listen, uh, we are sitting here for the third week in a row uh, talking about what a big game Florida State is getting ready to play. And I don't yep. think that well, this is something we have not been able to enjoy in the past. So, listen, I'm very excited about the the 4-2 start. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, as you said, Fish, they thoroughly dominated NC State in the first half, just didn't finish the job uh, for all the reasons that we've mentioned. But certainly uh, the 4-2 start – is uh, been fantastic for the program. It certainly seems like things are shooting in the right direction for the first time in a while with this program. So uh, that's fun. But uh, now we turn forward to Clemson, and it's going to be a mighty challenge. Clemson comes in as the uh, fifth, fourth or fifth ranked team, depending on what poll you want to uh, go by. But uh, it's a huge game on Saturday night, and what should be a close to sold out crowd, if not sold out, uh, just. Your thoughts, uh, Fish, I'll let you start on the challenge Clemson poses. Yeah, Clemson's, we've talked about it defensive line wise. I, I think they're one of the top two or three defensive lines in the country. So that matchup, you got to look. Does, you know, Robert Scott play? I thought Robert Scott played well in the first half. So that's a good sign. How they do on the other side, Turrentine, uh, or if that's how you pronounce his name, 
uh, he needs to have a much better game on Saturday night for FSU to have a legit shot to beat Clemson. They can't, he can't let those guys put that type of pressure off that edge. I think the defensive end for Clemson, he played five snaps. Uh, the guy, Xavier Thomas, had two ta- who had two sacks and three tackles for loss. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so, you know, you don't want that guy going off and, you know, then you get you, then you have to risk short and getting hurt. But if they can control up front, that's what it's going to come down. We talk about this every week, the whole line D line house, Florida state, they need verse at a hundred percent or close to it. And they need Robert Scott to have any shot. Uh, I, I haven't heard anything on love it. If he's coming back, but if he doesn't play, I do think Clemson will have success running between the tackles. Well, listen, I think it's uh, I think I think who plays is going to be a huge part of this matchup uh, as we'll get into as we go through this. Clemson is probably I talked with Larry Williams, the publisher or senior writer for Tiger Illustrated, the Clemson rival site. And he says this is about as healthy as Clemson will have been all year. Uh, you referenced Xavier Thompson and we'll get into Thomas. And we'll get to him a little bit later. But uh, certainly uh, this may not be the, the perfect time for Florida State to pick them up because Florida State is a little bit beat up. Uh, you know, you know, there's several players that uh, we know um, were hurting after last week's game. But uh, back to Clemson real quick. Uh, you know, Mark, um, they're, you're not going to confuse this Clemson offense with the Clemson offenses of 2020, 2019, Trevor Lawrence and all of those offenses moving backward. Uh, but you're certainly not going to confuse this 2022 version of Clemson off, Clemson's offense with the 21 version. Uh, what have you seen from uh, the quarterback DJ? I can't pronounce the last name, but uh, Ugal Lele. Yeah, there you go. Uh, 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 But anyway, so what have you seen from DJ this year that uh, has helped him improve? Uh, he looks like a much better quarterback, uh, completing almost 10 percent more of his passes this season than he did a season ago. Yeah, I I think. The axiom that a quarterback's best friend is a running game is holds true with him too. I think, you know, with Shipley being effective, it really helps DJU. I'll just call him that. Um, it really helps him um, open some things up. They, I, I, I'm, they do a lot of RPOs. Um, you know, they throw the ball down. The, he throws the ball down the field really nice, but and he and he's hit hit more. I think, but I think the thing, the big matchup to watch is to see how we're going to handle their offense because th- they like to run him a lot. Right. And we yeah. like to, we like to play a lot of two deep safeties. So that means light boxes. And when you run the quarterback, you pick up an extra blocker. And so how are we going to mitigate that? I have a feeling they're going to come out and test that early uh, by running him. And he's a hoss. He's a big guy. He's hard to bring down, um, you know, um, not a real physical run. He's not Cam Newton physical, but he is a big guy. Yeah, so, as uh, Jared Verse said after practice on Tuesday, he's as big as I am at quarterback. And, uh, exactly. Uh, to exactly. your point, he has run the ball much more. He's a team second leading rusher, 368 yards, which is uh, already uh, out out game what he had last year. So yes, he is. Uh, yeah a force to be reckoned with on the ground and through the air this year. I mean, he's, uh, they have used it. In fact, he's outrushed uh, Phil Moffa, who is a backup running back, who is no, uh, no slouch himself, at least. Exactly. So how, how are we going to handle that defensively? How, how is Fuller going to, to try to mitigate that? Because when you run the quarterback, again, you pick up an extra blocker. And if you're going to stay in, in, in two, two, two deep safeties, that can be a problem. And so we're going to have to figure out a way to stop that and stop everything else on top of it, which means we're probably going to have to play. Uh, corners are going to be isolated a little bit. Are those guys going to be able to cover, um, whether it be zone or, or man, um, is going to be a big factor in this game uh, for me. So it'll be interesting to see how we handle that. JP, what are your thoughts on the Clemson offense? We haven't even gotten to Will Shipley yet, who's uh, one of the more outstanding backs in the ACC. <laughs> Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, Clemson and how FSU may attack the Clemson offense? Well, uh, Dewey, uh, Dewey, <laughs> DJ, Dewey on Galele. That like fun. Um, <laughs> it looked so much better than he was last year, especially in throwing the football, but he does not have the elite receiving core that Clemson 
used to having. So I think it's mitigated a little bit. I mean, they're not terrible, but they're not what, you know, it's not the old T Higgins, Ray, Ray McLeod, uh, and Mike Williams show. Um, but I, so I think, you know, I think from the secondary standpoint, we can handle that running game with Shipley and the quarterback is tough. And I, and I agree with Mark, you know, we, we seem very stubborn with those two high safety sometimes, man. It's just, you know, let's drop the safety down and start dictating to them what they need to do and, and make them play into their weakness, what I think is their weakness. So we'll see what, uh, we'll see what we do defensively, but um, I, yeah, I, I would agree. We need, we need love it. We need everybody. We need all hands on deck uh, to stop the running game. And Shipley is a freaking hoss. Well, he's got eight touchdowns already this year. Um, short yardage, red zone. He's uh, damn near unstoppable with the with the threat of the quarterback run too. So, um, you know, defense is going to have to. We're going to have to try and out physical these guys, which is not going to be easy. Uh, but um, diverse is going to have to have a big game. He's going to have to get some pressure. He's going to have to disrupt in the passing game. And you know, we'll we'll if we can stop the run, I think we might have. A, you know, and I say stop the run less than 150 yards. We might have a chance to to win this game. Yeah. And listen, like you said, they uh, they don't have the T Higgins uh, and uh, guys of that nature, but they do have seven guys that have 10 plus catches yeah. uh, and they have a pair of arguably uh, might have the best duo uh, duo of tight ends emerging in the ACC with Davis Allen and uh, Jake Bur- Stool. Uh, you know, listen, uh, those guys can uh, – they can get an 11 and 12 personnel and create some issues at line on the second level. Mark, uh, talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what you can do or what your concerns are with those two tight ends. Yeah. Well, when you, when you have two tight ends in the game, it, it really stresses out a defense uh, because you, you got, you have to now bring down another defender to take the extra gap and whether they play them on opposite sides of the ball or they go tight end wing, um, trying to out leverage you, um, we don't seem to handle that real well sometimes, um, and that's, that could be an issue. And, and then on top of that, you got to cover these guys on the intermediate routes. Now we've been better on that here lately, but look, it's going to come. It's going to come down to um, you know, re, re, look, what, we got to do better rerouting guys, right? We can't let these tight ends and all these guys get free releases off the line and just let them sit down in in, in a zone or you know push off and. And versus man coverage and, and separate. So we're going to have to, you know, jam on line of scrimmage, reroute them, disrupt timing, give the pass rush a chance to get there in effect DJ, because if there's one thing that I'm still not convinced about with DJ is, you know, when he has to go to a secondary read or he has to wait on a route, um, mm-hmm. he, that's where he becomes really inconsistent or he becomes indecisive. So, our ability to disrupt route running, disrupt timing, give the pass rush a chance to get there, harass them. Um, that's what we have to do in order to render him a little less effective than he's been in the last few games. Yeah. And, and as JP mentioned, uh, they're uh, unbelievable in the Reds. He mentioned the running back, Shipley, but uh, – uh, Clemson has the number one ranked offense in the red zone, having scored on 32 of 32 trips, including uh, 24 touchdowns of those 32. So uh, a tremendous challenge. Uh, and uh, we haven't even gotten to the good side of the ball for them yet. <laughs> so, right, right. Uh, which, and we're going to let Fish back in here. Fish, you've already been talking a little bit about the defense, but, uh, you know, obviously a very talented and uh, deep front four. Uh, and listen, they're getting healthy. Uh, they're expecting and Breezy, the defensive tackle back. Uh, you mentioned that Xavier Thomas came back last week, played six snaps against Boston College, had two sacks. He's already on the second, tied for second on the team in sacks. That is not, we haven't even talked about RJ Henry and Miles Murphy on the other side at defensive end or Tyler Davis. So, uh, and that, there's more guys to talk about. So just talk about the talent on Clemson's front four on defense, Fish. Uh, their front four is about as good as you'll ever see. I mean, Florida State's had those D lines that have, they basically can do everything with their front four. They don't have to blitz. They don't have to, they don't have to do anything fancy because those guys get through the gaps, get up the field, up, you know, they, they put so much pressure on you up front and it forces you into mistakes and play quicker than you want to and get you, a, you know, out of your comfort zone. And you talk, you know, going back a little bit with Cle- like Clemson's offense. The reason they've had success this year is because they've stayed out of those long yardage situations. So that's what they're, they do on defense. They put your offense 
in those uncomfortable situations, those second and 10, second and 15. And if you could do that and you force an offense to always play behind the sticks and they do a great job of that, you have a great shot at winning every game. And they are so good up front. I don't think most people realize how talent, talented and good they are. Um, it's This is a major, major matchup is their D-line with FSU's O-line. I, I think – if FSU could hold up and they don't have to be great, they just have to be solid. If they could be solid, FSU has a great shot. If Clemson plays a way that I know they could play and they play to that level, it's going to be a long night. I'm just telling that front four can wreak havoc on every, any offense. And yeah. you, you've seen FSU's offense is not as efficient when they're in second and 15, second and 17, third and 12s. That's not how FSU is going to have success. So, at that D line, if you can control those guys up front, then you know what? It could be a good night for the Florida State Seminoles. Yeah, as, as you alluded to, uh, second in the nation against the run uh, at 63.7 yards per game and a very aggressive at- attacking style of defense out of West Goodwin's 4 uh, 3. Base 4 3 will play some odd front, Mark. Uh, but uh, listen, they're 30th in sacks, uh, 2.5 per game, uh, fifth in tackles made behind the line of scrimmage at 8. eight, point, eight uh, TFLs per game. Mark, uh, just talk a little bit about uh, your concerns uh, or how you think Florida State should go about attacking this defense. <laughs> you know, I, I was watching uh, R.J. Henry, uh, I don't know if it was last week or the week before, and Xavier Thomas wasn't even in the game. Breezy wasn't even in the game. And I started thinking to myself, okay, how is Jazz turn time going to handle R.J. Henry? That's <laughs> to me is <laughs> – um, that's a, that's a, that's a concern, he, and then Rob Scott too. I mean, you know, he's he Rob is is obviously our one of our better guys, but you know, it's uh, gee, it's an issue. So I hope that uh, we look the way to mitigate that is is you know you know do you put a tight end over on on that side? Well, that that could help or hurt because all it may do is widen him out and give him a a, a wider path to the quarterback but jazz one of his strengths is his length right and so that kind of helps um you know chipping chipping with the back bottom line is joe jordan's got to get the ball out of his hand quick um and we need to we need to make sure that you know it, whether it's on takeoffs uh getting some matchups on the outside and and throw and throwing nine routes um you know quick slants uh quick pass to the tight end screens I mean, we're going to have to be really creative in the passing game, and especially on first down, to keep us out of those long yardage situations. The thing that got us into trouble last week was getting in second and long, and then third and long, and then teams are able to play coverage, and and it, it, that's just not our strength. So, um, yeah, the concern is the defensive line. Um, I, I don't foresee us having great success running the ball, um, you know. Just, consistently anyways i mean they're just really good well uh, so that's a concern well listen we know florida state's gonna have to find some big plays and probably big plays in the passing game and they've exceeded their all season long jp uh they've won the better big play offenses in america uh where clemson has struggled on defenses they're not, uh, ranked 95th at 256 passing yards given up per game uh they have been. They have had all but three players in their secondary miss at least one game uh, this year. Uh, you know, can uh, Jordan Travis and this Florida State passing game? And obviously, Mark alluded to you got to give Jordan time, but Jordan can move and get him out of the pocket, uh, roll him out. Can FSU be successful enough uh, throwing the ball against Clemson to uh, you know Arthur an upset on Saturday night? Well, I think that's a must. You know, Johnny Wilson's going to have to have a huge game. I think Michael Pittman's going to have to have a big game. Um, they're going to have to. They're going to need some explosives against this Clemson team because you're not going to drive, you know, eight, ten plays down the field on them. They're going to need some explosives. So they they're going to need some, um, you know, need some pass protection to give give Jordan some time to to look downfield and for these guys to get open. So it's you know, like Mark said, it's on protection, and I think they they are going to have to keep some guys in. So it may be. You know, even some two man, three man routes, but you got to uh, protect Jordan. Let it let him work a little bit, but throw the ball down the field. They've got to they're going to if they're going to win, they're going to have at least two big plays in the passing game for touchdowns. I don't think there's any question about that. Um, I don't think I don't think Trayshawn Ward's going to play this week. Uh, have you guys heard anything on that? Even if he does. 
uh, or doesn't. I think the running game is not going to be something you can feature against this front four. Um, I mean, a screen game, a get the ball out quick to the wide receivers, uh, especially Johnny, let him, let him run over some people. Uh, I would give him, you know, four or five touches in that game in that way. Same with Michael Pittman. You know, those I see them do this to the Bucks a lot because especially when they had Akeem Hicks in there, you got these big guys, Vita Vea and the big guys in the middle, um, you know, just don't deal with them. Get the ball to the outside and go, you know, just go. That's where you're that's where you're weakest. So get the ball outside and go. And I think that's that that's got to be the best plan for for FSU. And of course, special teams. If it's a close game, will uh, no like no doubt play a part in this. And of course, uh, somehow or another, uh, PT or BD Potter for Clemson has on his twentieth year of eligibility and is back. He's been uh, very solid, eleven of thirteen this year, and of course has been uh, a model of consistency. Now they have not been very aggressive in the return game, although they have returned fourteen of eight uh, twenty-eight punt return opportunities, but only averaging five yards. So. Uh, but they do have a good they kickers uh, punters averaging about forty yards uh, per kick on twenty eight kicks. So uh, you know, listen, very good uh, field goal kicker, not so great uh, at punter is average, uh, and of course they've not been very aggressive in the uh, return game. But all right, to close out the Clemson preview, guys, I want to ask you a surprise question. It is second and eight. And you're on the 22 yard line of the Clemson Tigers uh, with down by two scores. Uh, what is your play call on second and or, or an eight? And how, or how do you end game that? Uh, Mark, I'll start with you. So, so tell me again. So second and eight on the 20. On the 22. Second and eight on the 22. Two scores? Uh, with 38 seconds to go, and you're down by two points. How many timeouts? <laughs> uh, let's go with two. two let's go with, let's go with two, two, two timeouts. How many were there yeah. left that gets NC State? Well, I mean, if, if we're down by what, 11, down by no, 10. We're down by two, two points. Oh, two points. Uh, you said yeah. the oh, same yeah, scenario man. we found yeah. ourselves in a week ago. Yeah, no, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm a. Uh, like you said two scores. <laughs> yeah, I thought you said two scores too. Two points. Two points. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah. I may have. I'm t- I got a little jet lag going on. I hear you. Yeah, no, OL. Oh, well, <laughs> look, I, uh, of course, it depends. Through the course of the game, what you've done well, what matchups you've been able to exploit, all that kind of thing. I mean, that factors into it, right? So, you know, if if obviously Clemson, I'm, I'm thinking they're going to try to pressure somehow. I, I would try to, like JP said, get the ball to the outside or get Jordan on a run somehow to where you can, you know, do some kind of unbalanced or something, some way you can leverage, uh, get some leverage on the outside and either roll them out for a run quarterback run or some kind of simple, you know, why stick, you know, some kind of tight end stick or, you know, slant bubble screen, something to, to maybe try to advance the ball and maybe you break a tackle and score a touchdown. What I'm not going to do is I'm not going to put the ball 20 yards in the air <laughs> um, with a middle safety in, in, in corners off. I'm not going to do that, you know, um, for sure. But I'm, uh, I'm not, but I'm not just going to, I don't, I'm not necessarily just going to run it and, and hope for a kick. I, I, I will be aggressive enough, um, but also calculated, you know, high, high percentage plays. All right, Fish, what would you do? I mean, if you're going to throw the ball, it needs to be to Johnny Wilson uh, because, one, you're throwing it up high, and I think if he's going up high and someone else is going up high, nothing bad's going to happen. The worst that happens is an incompletion. Uh, but I would run him. I, I would – I'd get if you have two timeouts, I'd get him to the edge and let create a play where – he has the ability to use his legs to either score or get you closer to kicking a field goal to the point where it's basically an extra point. So that would be my two options. Either go with Johnny Wilson, but I'm like, I, I'm not calling the same play we called last week. That's for sure. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you something. I'll tell you something that people don't do anymore that would, that really works against teams like Clemson is run a trap, you know, to run a trap up the middle, you know, quarterback trap. You know, flare the back, X block, hit the linebacker. Guys are penetrating up the field. Guys rushing in off the edge. Split that joker. Run Travis right up the middle. That's a great right, one. What are you running in that situation? What's your, what's your end of game? Second, eight, 22, 38 seconds, down by two points. Every single time, boys. And that's uh, roll right or bootleg to the right. Fake fake in, roll to the right. Uh, trips right. Take my – uh, well, I'll, I'll go – Twins right, 
Um, I'll put the tight end on, on the right side and I'll roll out to the right and I'll let that tight end block down and then escape up a little wheel route to the left. The throw back to the tight end works every freaking time. Works on the five-yard line, works on the 10-yard line every single time. Take, take advantage of their aggression. Little uh, then, And Jordan, if it's not there, Jordan can run it and we can come to fight on third down. All right. Well, we'll get to our uh, predictions for this game a little bit later. But uh, now we're going to kind of go through into our uh, little free-for-all part of the show. Uh, usually we talk about coaches' hot seats. That's usually the topic for discussion. Uh, we're going to move away from that because I saw a disturbing tw- trend in NFL football this past weekend that I'm worried will – Uh, make its way through the rest of uh, the levels of football, including college football. Uh, Last week, uh, someone made the grave, did the grave injustice of taking Tom Brady to the ground. And uh, and obviously this was a overreaction to Tua. And then we saw it again on Monday night football with uh, Chris Jones being flagged for landing on top of uh, whoever the quarterback he was playing against. Um, uh, but anyway, I don't remember who was in that ball game. Was it the Raiders? Yeah, Derek yeah it was the Raiders. Okay. Yeah, Derek so he fa- he actually did. You know, listen, he was playing football. He fell on top of a guy. Uh, did not look <laughs> like it was. Uh, it didn't look like he was trying to hurt him. Uh, listen, how close are we to uh, putting flags on these quarterbacks in the uh, pro level where you can't you can't touch them? Uh, how long can we call this game football if we're going to play it that way? How does a guy like Tom Brady, who professes his love for football, not come out and make a statement against that call, even though he benefited <laughs> from it? Uh, I mean, what are we doing with football, guys? Well, I, I'll tell you this. I was there at the game, and um, first of all, Jerome Boger, who made that call, is one of the worst refs in the NFL. He's terrible. And that call was so egregious on so many levels. First of all, it it basically decided the game because the Falcons, I hate to tell you this, but the Falcons were kicking the Bucks' ass in the second half. They were running the ball at will. And if they get the ball there with four minutes left, which they should have gotten the ball, uh, even if they have to go the length of the field, they've got three timeouts to work with and four downs to work with. And all they have to do is turn around and hand off the ball because the Bucks team defense was gassed. They weren't stopping the run. They were injured. I mean, that really kind of decided the game. And it's it, it, was, it was egregious on so many levels. And even his explanation was that he, um, he unnecessarily threw him to the ground. In no way, shape, or – I mean, Grady Jarrett's coming around the corner. He grabs Brady. The only way to get him down is to kind of flip your hips and, and roll. He rolled him down. Brady's head didn't even hit the turf. That's how light it was. And, you know, I, I'm sure there was directives that went out to the officials like we can't have anybody slung to the ground like happened with Tua. But if you put those two plays side by side, they're completely different. Um, one one – one guy slams him to the ground. The other guy basically lays him down. And it, it's just an egregious call. The, the one on on Monday night with Derek Carr and, and Chris Jones was equally as ridiculous because Jones put, uh, knocked the ball loose and in going for the fumble, land, his full weight landed on the quarterback. These are both situations where you have officials going by the letter of the law and completely ignoring the spirit of the game and what's happening in front of them. Did, did Was Brady close slung to the ground? Yes, lightly. Uh, did he? Did Chris Jones land on Derek Carr? Yes, as he was going for the football. So, And this goes back to my contention that we need to have ex-players refing these games and mm. not lawyers. The physics of the game. He would understand the physics of the game that if – if you're, you're swinging your hips to get the guy down, you're not slamming him down. If you're going for a fumble, you're, you're, not land, you're not purposely landing your weight on the quarterback. And that's, you know, and that's, I don't know why these officials continue to, to try to officiate this game like they're in a courtroom. They're not. It's a field of, it's a, it's a fast moving NFL football game that involves physics of very fast, powerful men. And you have to keep that in consideration when you're looking at these plays. Well, listen, it was bad enough when we got to the point where they were calling penalties because a hit looks physical or overly physical, and that's just a part of the game. Mark, your thoughts on what's going on with the 
uh, disappearing of contact in football. <laughs> I saw something on a, on Twitter. It was the it was the lead up for the NFL today from like 1978, something like that, <laughs> right? And every single clip they showed would have been penalized today. Every yep. single one, clotheslines, spearing, uh, quarterbacks getting hammered, you know, high, low. I mean, it was, and I'm I was thinking to myself, man, what have we gotten ourselves to in, at this point, you know? The guys are bigger, faster, so much bigger and faster than they were back then, though. And, and you know, the you know mass times velocity. Yeah. <laughs> you're talking about guys can get broke, get broke really easy. The human body can only take so much. That all that being said, you know, there's got to be some common sense put into some of this stuff. I think you know JP was talking about it. There's just got to be common sense about the physics exactly. of the game and in how a guy that's 315 pounds can't change direction or stop his momentum on the, on the drop of a hat. I mean, it, you know, th there's gotta be some understanding about how the game is played and what guys are being asked to do. And so, I mean, there was one situation, I think, it was, I think it was, it was the bucks. I believe JP wasn't, uh, I forgot who it was. It Shaq Barrett. Somebody Beat was rushing, somebody was rushing a passer and stopped, right? Yeah. Stopped yeah. because he thought he'd want to hit the guy and the guy throws a touchdown pass. You remember what I'm talking about? Yes. Yeah. It happened last year. He came around the corner and the, the position ready to throw. And then he stopped, pulled it down and moved out to the right. But Shaq would have hit him had he thrown the ball at, right. at that time. So he, yeah, he stopped. And yeah. then he was like, Oh shit. He's got, he's still got the ball. I got to go get him. It, yeah. It was clear as day. And I asked Shaq about it. He goes, yeah. He goes, if he throws the ball there and I hit him, that's a penalty. So I stopped. But he goes, then he pulls the ball down and he runs some more. And now you got quarterbacks who are faking the slide and then continuing to run. That should be a penalty right there. Right. That should be a penalty. You know, and you shouldn't be able to, to double pump because once you pump and the guy stops, I mean, you're ruining the game. We're just, <laughs> yeah, that, there's got to be some common sense in all this. I understand you don't want to get guys severely hurt, and that's understandable. If you're taking a cheap shot, if a guy's <laughs> vulnerable and you and you're on the ground, okay. But if it's in the course of playing the game or it's in the course of, you know, you're on a path and, you know, you, you, just, again, common sense says he can't stop his momentum and he's, you know, you're asking too much. It doesn't make, you know, it doesn't make any sense to, 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 to do that. It's, it's changing the way the game is played. I, I go back to targeting on receivers, you know, defenseless receivers. Quarterback, they ought to flag the quarterback too. Yeah. If, I, if I'm a quarterback throwing – you know, a seam route into, into a half safety. I know that half safety is coming. I know he can't touch him. I can throw that ball knowing that he can't touch him. I can throw I can throw an out on a hard corner knowing that corner can't blow him up. You know, yeah. I mean, in, 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 if quarterbacks do that and lead their guys into those hits, throw the quarterback out. He's just as responsible as that guy. You know, 100%. and yeah. so, yeah. Fish, you got any thoughts on yeah, that? I mean, I didn't get a chance to watch the Bucs game, but I did watch Monday night. I – I thought the call on Chris Jones, it's, I mean, it, it was terrible. I mean, it just, that was just, it almost seemed like the referees had money on the game. I hate to say that, but <laughs> you make a call like that at that spot, it looks kind of fishy to me that you make that call. I mean, it just, it was a terrible call. But, uh, I mean, you know, the whole targeting thing, I think, I just, I don't like, I don't like all these rules. Like, I think if you, you, you penalize a guy for 15 yards, Expect, you, know, you look at the college game, you, t you penalize a guy for 15 yards. You I don't think you take them out. You you'd have to, they'd have to get like multiple. It's just, they, they're taking away everything. You saw it. Listen, FSU, um, you know, with the NC state game, that, that targeting, I, I, I thought Benson. it was a question. Yeah. I thought it was a questionable call. They got, you know, that he did hit the guy, but I, it's hard. You're asking a guy that turns violent, his hips. So they called it, which is not right. Nice well, the, the, the farmer hit. hit. That's not yeah, right. But it's, 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 it it's hard. Right. It's, but you're asking guys to come to a complete stop after they're running full speed one way. It's just, I don't know. Yeah. It just like, like uh, Mark it's said, tough. it's bodies don't just change. You're not, they're not meant to just stop their momentum once it's going forward, you know? Well, and you're saying, Oh, well it's, there's too much that goes into it. 
So, well, and we'll see if there's any trickle down this week because most things that happen in the NFL end up happening in college football, and it'll be interesting yeah. to see if we have one of these calls in college football uh, because of what's going on in the NFL. But all right, well, that's a fun. That was a fun discussion. I love it when we talk about things like that. So, uh, thanks for entertaining me on that. All right, so mm-hmm. uh, week six, week seven, whatever it is of college football season, a lot of huge games this weekend. Of course, we all love college football, and, uh, and we know the people listening and watching do too. So, guys, some huge football games. I want to get y'all's thoughts on these, uh, and we'll end with, obviously, Clemson at Florida State. Uh, but, uh, you know, a huge game in the Big Ten. 10th-ranked uh, Penn State goes to Michigan, the fifth-ranked Wolverines. I believe it's at Michigan. That's what I put on my sheet anyway. Uh, but, um, you know, listen, uh, obviously uh, kind of a pick game where they're ranked Michigan is at home um, defending Big Ten champions uh, Fish I'll start with you who you got against uh, Penn State Michigan I think the home field advantage is going to make a difference in this game if it was at Penn State I'd like Penn State but and they got two very good running backs but Michigan now over the last year has been in these games their kids have learned how to win these games they have you know beat they beat Ohio State last year. I just think they have the edge. I think they got the better team. Um, I think they'll win. It's not going to be a blowout. I think it will be within seven points, but I like the Wolverines to pull out a game uh, that, like I said, more comfortable being in these situations the last year and a half. So, All right. Uh, Fish, I mean, uh, Sully, who you got? Yeah, I, I, same reason. I think Michigan um, at home um, – Michigan seems to have it going. Um, I watched Penn State against Auburn. They they did look pretty good <laughs> against Auburn. I, I was I'll give them that. Um, those running backs are pretty good. I just I just think Michigan's probably a little a little further ahead than Penn State right now. I'm gonna buck the trend. I'm gonna go Penn State. Uh, I, I like their <laughs> game, and I hate Jim Harbaugh. So I just yeah. uh, I'm, I'm a big <laughs> and so. Yeah, Jim Harbaugh can be uh, kind of entertaining and at times irritating. Uh, so I think he's good for the game because uh, it's not really – well, I guess some of his comments have been – Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's a good game. Absolutely. Got to have a villain. Absolutely. Got to have a villain. I still go back. James Franklin had one of the best lines ever when he asked – you know, somebody asked him how he picks his assistant coaches. And he goes uh, – the Wives, yeah. Wives. Because those yeah. are really common. They know they know how to get things. They know how to recruit. Yeah, they know how to recruit. I'm going to go with Michigan. So we got three to Michigan, one to Penn State. All right. So in a game we all had circled big on our calendars early in the year, 19th ranked Kansas goes to I believe an Oklahoma team that's trying not to lose four in a row. Is that right? Is that correct? I know it's going to be their fourth loss. Uh, who you guys got the uh, the fighting Lance Leopolds or? Uh, the uh, inconsistent and sporadic uh, Brett Venables. Who you got, JP? I'm going. I ain't picking Brett Venable. He just got boat raced 49 and nothing by an ordinary Texas team, for God's sakes. <laughs> there, I mean, I've never seen a program nosedive like that in my life. I mean, uh, what, where have you been? <laughs> they, <laughs> we, we didn't lose 49 nothing, did we? Yeah, that's uh, true. Yeah. Um, no, that, that's ugly. I don't, you know, I never, I gotta, I gotta say, I never thought Venables was going to make a great head coach, but, um, whatever the hell they, they took the heart and soul out of Oklahoma. I'm, I'm going with Kansas. They're on a freaking roll. Let's go. Mark. Yeah. You know, if this was early in the year, you'd say, well, it's an anomaly, but at this point in the year, you are who you are. And yeah. Kansas has been solid all year. Um, and then OU has just just fallen off the rails, and I don't see that trend stopping anytime soon. I think Kansas is just playing the better ball right now. They're, they've got self belief. OU's asking questions about themselves right now. Um, you know, they're under a lot of heat, a lot of pressure, and they're in that space right now. If something goes bad, they're going to start hanging their heads. You know, they're just they're going to be uh, what do you a uh, little PTSD from last week. So um, I'm going to go. I'm going to go with the Fighting Leopolds. <laughs> hey, you got fish. Hey, Lincoln took not only his quarterback, he took his whole team. Uh, the co- the wide receivers, everybody left. That is not the same Oklahoma team that I watched last year. I, I just can't go against Kansas right now in that game. They're playing better in Oklahoma. It's, it's hard when you're in the situation Oklahoma's in because 
they're heading in the wrong direction. That that flood's coming through. It's tough to get that thing turned around midstream. So I think Kansas will win the game. Yeah, I agree with all you guys. I think by the end of this game, Brent Venables is going to wish he could click his heels and go back to Clemson. That <laughs> will be three and four. Uh, he, Dorothy is uh, not in Kansas anymore. There's no, there's no Trevor Lawrence or That's Xavier right. Thomas there, is there? That's right. All right, and another huge Big 12 game, even bigger than that one. Uh, number eight, Okie State and the Mullet uh, take on TC, number the 13th ranked TCU Horn Frogs under first year head coach Sonny Dykes. Uh, should be a very, could be a very high scoring game. Uh, Fish, who you got in this one? I got the over. I don't know who's going to win. I, I just. <laughs> I, I mean, Oklahoma State, I, listen, I, I still think that coach is one of the most underrated coaches in college football. I don't think he gets enough credit for what he's done there. Uh, Sonny Dykes has done a good job. Garrett Riley, Lincoln Riley's brother, is OC at TCU. He's done a phenomenal job putting that offense on the map. And um, TCU being at home, I'll give them a slight edge just because they're at home. Uh, but I, it, for gambling purposes, take the over. <laughs> Right. <laughs> you mean, you, inter, entertainment purposes. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. Entertainment purposes. Take the over. It's Take almost over. socially acceptable to uh, start talking about gambling. Yeah. <laughs> no, you know, this would be a fun game to watch for sure. Um, yes, a lot of points. A lot of points. I think, uh, you know, well coached teams. Um, you know, I, Mike Gundy has done a great job for a long time with these guys. He really has. And, um, I, I just I don't know I just I don't have a good feel either way. Um, I'm kind of like kind of like you know fish. It's 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 going to come down to who has the ball last, and I'll say Okie State gets the ball last, and the fighting uh, mullets get it done. JP, they got the over under at 68 points. You want the want the over? Uh, uh, Okie State's not bad defensively though, are they? Last time I checked, they're not. They, no, their DC left Ohio Oklahoma, Ohio State. And they they lost their defense this year. They they give up they give up points. So, well, I, I learned this week that Mike Gundy um, was this close to becoming the Bucks at times. It has no bearing on this game whatsoever. But I've always been a big Mike Gundy fan. I'm not going to stop now. So, power to the mullet. Um, they Oakley State stays undefeated. Well, I'm going to go with uh, TCU. I think they've got the better of the two quarterbacks. Mac Dugan's had a great year, and I predict that there are more points scored in this ball game than Iowa scores the entire 2022 season. So, <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm going with the over. You right. out on a limb on that one, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I really am. I really am. There may be more passes. Uh, well, I will say this. Iowa may punt more than the number of passes uh, throughout the rest of the season than the number of passes thrown in this game. So there, yeah. there's a positive spin for Iowa. They may actually do more of something than somebody else. Uh, all right, so uh, another huge big – now we move back to the Big Ten. Uh, huge Big Ten game really uh, on the uh, weaker side of the conference. Minnesota at number 24, Illinois. And I know we all saw Illinois as a 24th ranked, uh, 24th ranked team coming into the season by the midseason point. Uh, <laughs> we'll uh, – Will Brett Bielema do a cannonball into one of the mini lakes in Minnesota and uh, torpedo uh, the boat? Of, uh, <laughs> what, what's his name there in uh, Minnesota? PJ Fleck. PJ. PJ. PJ uh, Fleck. Your buddy fish. You start. Hey, listen. I and I told I told a buddy of mine who was a Bucks fan. Watch out for this wide receiver coach with the Bucks. He's going to be a head coach one day, and it was PJ Fleck. Uh, he's a very good coach and. I Minnesota, it's they're weird. Yeah, I watched yeah. them. I, I've watched them this year, and they've been really good. And then they had their lovely performance against Purdue, where they just could. You know, they are all about their run game. If they get that run game going, uh, they're very big up front. They've got a very good defense. I think their defense is rated in the top five of all of college football this year. Uh, their coordinator Joe Ross, he's going to be a head coach soon. I like Minnesota just because I think they're the better team. Um, I think Belima has done a phenomenal job, but um, he's, he's feasted. They feasted on the teams that they needed to, to get to the record they're at. Uh, but Minnesota is a better football team. I think they'll win the game. JP. 
I think we lost JP. Uh, well, um, looks like uh, Tommy. What's that? Did you lose me? You got me. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, hello, hello. You good? Yeah. yeah my uh, my uh, signal's been going in and out today. Um, it looks like they may not have their quarterback though. Tommy DeVito may uh, may not play this week. So uh, for Illinois, so I I, um, I don't know. I, I I fell in love with PJ Fleck when he was here in Tampa. Uh, just like. The dude, you knew, you knew right then that that guy was going to be a head coach. I mean, he had it written across his forehead that one day he was going to be a head coach. And I said, you know, he's going to be a damn good one. And it's turned out to be that way. So I like to row the boat anytime I can. So I'll go Minnesota. <laughs> All right. So I'm the last one. All right. So I'm, I'm going to Minnesota. Mark, did you pick that one? No, I didn't. All right, which one did you, who you have? I got Minnesota. I yeah, I, I'm going to go to Minnesota. I'm just looking to look at Illinois' schedule and who they've beaten. And I think Minnesota's, yeah, Minnesota's definitely had the, the, the tougher schedule. Um, you know, I, I just, yeah, I think Minnesota's probably the better team. I'll go with, I'll go with Minnesota. Yeah, well, I, all those little sayings, yeah, wooski, mooski, whatever it is, I can't even keep up. All right, so moving closer to home, LSU goes to Florida. I'm a little bit concerned that Brian Kelly, because he's going to the swamp, is going to wear a Steve Irwin outfit. And if you guys remember who Steve Irwin was, he was the Australian animal guy that used to go catch alligators and, and shots. Yes. So we'll, we'll see if Brian Kelly uh, wears a Steve Irwin outfit. At one, the one, one of the greatest commercials ever was that this is Sports Center commercial with Steve Irwin that was coming in and, and the alligators came out of the elevator. Yep. And he says, I got this. Remember that? Yep. <laughs> that's what's so, that's that, ever. That'll be Brian Kelly on Saturday yeah. afternoon in Gainesville. Uh, listen, I think it's going to be Florida. I don't think it's – well, I'll say it's not going to be close, but I think it's going to be Florida. Uh, I I think uh, – we got some issues down in Bat- Baton Rouge. Uh, but I'm going Florida by uh, seven to ten points. Fish, who you got? Oh, man. It's t- I, I watched the Gators last week, and I thought they were going to blow Missouri out, and they struggled. Uh, it, their offense is painful to watch. Um, I, I think I think I'm going to go with LSU with the upset. I, I just think, honestly, I, I've seen more from them, even though they got blown out last week. I've seen more from them on both sides of the ball that I feel more confident taking them than the Gators, but the Gators are finding ways to win. So it wouldn't be a shocker, but I'll say LSU pulls up. So. JP. Mark, who you got LSU? Yeah. For? So, uh, Hey, it's Tom Petty night in the swamp, right? Yeah. That was, what does that mean? It means Florida's going to win. <laughs> no. I, I mean, I'm thinking. Look, I, I watched LSU last week, and and you know they 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 didn't look great. But I, I think Brian Kelly is a is a good coach. I think I think he'll get it going. And Florida, to me, is just I just don't see it. I just you know the, 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 their offense is is it's opportunistic, I guess, but it's it's not really consistent. And I, I just don't see anything that really scares me on offensively from Florida. Um, I, d- I just think LSU. Um, I, I just have a feeling they win the game. I do. Well, they might. They've won there before. When they weren't supposed to a couple of years ago. That's for sure. All LSU. Right. LSU's run defense is terrible. At least it was last week against Tennessee, and that's one thing Florida can do pretty consistently is run the football uh, with those three backs that they got and that offensive line. That's pretty damn good. Uh, they're underrated. Uh, you know, they can win games when Richardson throws for sixty-five yards. So I think, um, like I said, Tom Petty night. Everybody's going to be crazy. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to pick Florida and an emotional win in the swamp. You right. know, I, Richardson has five like touchdowns and eight picks. I mean, like he's he's really <laughs> trying to. <laughs> he's they're this winning year's games. DJ Uga Oh my god, <laughs> that's, who, that's who he is this year. All he right, can so, run, uh, he can run the deck on football, though. I can tell you that. Do that. Yeah. He can do that. He's he's yeah. He's an outstanding athlete. There's no doubt about that. All right, uh, quickly because I know JP's got to go in a couple seconds. We have got three more games to pick. Uh, number fifteen, NC State at uh, I'm sure a team that we had uh, in our poll at midseason. Number eighteen, Syracuse, who has one of the 
top <laughs> defenses in all of college football. Uh, NC State will more than likely, based off what I saw in the middle of the field on Saturday last Saturday night, without Devin Leary, I don't know that that's the case. Uh, even when they have Devin Leary, they could still not couldn't complete a pass to Thayer Thomas against Florida State. I'm going to go with Syracuse in the upset, guys, at the Carrier Dome. Uh, JP, who you got? Uh, I, you got to go with Syracuse. Um, if, if Devin Leary's not playing, um, I, I I wasn't very impressed with NC State. I haven't been impressed with them all year. We should have beat them. So I'll go Syracuse since they're at home. Uh, Sully? Yeah, I got to go Syracuse if Leary's not playing for sure. And it doesn't look like he's going to be able to play. I, he took a pretty – I mean, the way he didn't, he didn't look like uh, arm in a sling, big hit, look on his face. I don't yeah. see him playing, so um, and <laughs> so I don't know how they're going to generate any offense. So I got to go to Syracuse. They're going to hope the other team's punters run past the line of scrimmage. Um, <laughs> Fish, I don't know. It's hard for me to pick Syracuse. I've I, I know they're five and zero. Oh. They got a good run game. I'm not passing game's not very good. I, you know, I don't know. I guess I'll take Syracuse, but. We're very reluctantly. I honestly, I it wouldn't surprise me if NC State found a way to win this game too. You know, their defense is still very good, and I just like I said, Syracuse. They got an easy schedule. They've taken advantage of it, so I'll give a, a slightly towards Syracuse, but I'm not convinced that they're going to win the game. So, all right. Well, moving on to the uh, highest ranked on ranked matchup. In the of- back. Uh, number three, Alabama heads to Rocky Top, take on number six, Tennessee. Josh uh, Heupel has his offense uh, rolling along. I, I don't know whether they're playing the defensive back. They got in some trouble earlier in the week. Uh, of course, you like to have all your starters versus Bama, who may or may not be with uh, out Bryce Young, the quarterback, uh, and mm-hmm. former Heisman winner, current Heisman winner. Uh, JP, who you got? Bama at Tennessee. The third Saturday in October, huh? Um, it, look, Alabama, without their quarterback, looks pretty damn ordinary. Uh, and Tennessee is on a freaking roll. Uh, they they look great last week, and that atmosphere is, is, is tough. I think finally Tennessee has their number. They know that this is a rare opportunity. Um, and even if Bryce Young plays, I don't know how effective he could be. Uh, I'm going to go. I'm going to go with Tennessee here. Mark? Tennessee's a very confident team right now. They are they they believe, and uh, that means a lot. Uh, going, especially going into this game, they're going to be in Knoxville. Um, Alabama's got some question marks at quarterback going in. Um, as good as Bama usually is in these games, I think t- Tennessee is a confident football team that can score points. And um, so, yeah, I'm going to go Tennessee on this one. Fish. If Bryce plays, I like Bama, but if he doesn't, and I, I like Tennessee. Either way, I think it's going to be a great game. Um, I just – they're a different team without Bryce Young. So I, when, and, when, and when Bama loses, it's usually because a quarterback plays out of his mind and Hooker can run and throw, and that's, yeah. that's something yeah. that Alabama has, has Ten, struggled with listen, in the past. Tennessee, whether LSU is good or not, they did go into the – they went into their stadium and beat the tar out of them last week. And that's not easy to do whether they're good or not. I mean, it's always tough place to go and play. And they made them look like honestly Southern university last week. So I, 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 yeah. There's one factor you guys aren't considering. Tennessee's wearing orange helmets this game. Oh God. So is that a good thing? I don't know. Tennessee wearing orange helmets. It's like us wearing white helmets, right? (laughs) Oh, well, maybe they'll have it. I don't know. All right. Well, listen. This, this one's uh, this one's been bothering me all week because uh, uh, my heart tells me Bama, but my gut tells me Tennessee. And uh, unfortunately, right now my gut's bigger than my heart, so I'm going with Tennessee. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that's good reason is any. Yep, that's where we're going. Sweet, your guts bigger than your heart. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I said. That's what I said. <laughs> So uh, it was the easiest way to make the decision. Easiest way to make the decision. All right. So uh, let's Good go. Call. Let's come full circle and bring it all the way back to Tallahassee. To an hour. Florida State is a three and a half point underdog at home against Clemson. And they're uh, 
very uh, stingy defense and an improving <laughs> offense. Uh, JP, who you got? Well, I think it's I think it's seven and a half. Last time I checked, no, um, if it's no, three no. and a half, I'm definitely going. Um, listen, last week uh, I, I picked NC State. I hated to do it, but of course I was right again. Um, and I You're hate right. to do it this week, but it's barely right. I think I, I just think that what I've seen the last two weeks bothers me. Clemson is on a roll. Um, they, I just think they're too good up front defensively against our offensive line. It's going to be overmatched. So I hate to do it, but I think it's Clemson. Fish. I'm riding JP's coattails. I, I hate to do it too. Um, I just, I, I'm a big believer in games are one in the trenches. I think Clemson's in better shape on both O line and D line. I think their quarterback, while I'm not a big fan of DJ, I think he's played a lot better in the last few weeks. And they're the more healthy team. They're getting guys back. Florida State just not having love it. I, you know, I said to a friend of mine earlier today, you never knew how good love it was because it wasn't like he was an impact player uh, to the level that you've had top guys before D tackle. But without him, there's a big drop off. I mean, it's just night and day without love it. And who knows how healthy Cooper is. They just they showed last week the lack of depth, in, at, at, especially inside. I think Clemson's going to have success there, and that's why I'm picking them to win the game. It's just being able to control the line of scrimmage. Yeah, and JP, just I just checked the line is three and a half if the, the line is accurate. Um, really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I didn't think it got – I knew it had gone to five at one time, but right now, according to Yahoo Sports, it's three and a half. And according Jesus. to ESPN as well. Uh, Mark, I'll let you go last on this. Uh, listen, as I said earlier, I, I think that uh, Clemson is probably getting healthy at the right time. Florida State's a little beat up. Uh, that game last week was very physical. I'm sure Clemson was too at Boston College. I didn't see as much of it. Or is up front. And uh, listen, I can't. I'd be. I have picked Florida State to go seven and five. Uh, I can't pick them to win in every game. I have so far. That they've changed my mind that much over the court since the beginning of the year. But uh, I'm going to go by. I'm going to go with Clemson. I think it's going to be closer than most people uh, think. I do think that it's going to matter. Uh, you mentioned Cooper being dang, uh, dinged up in the NC State game. So was Jared Jackson. So was. Jamie Robinson, so was uh, Kevin Knowles. We saw uh, Verse came out for a couple plays. Uh, I think the health is going to matter in this game, and uh, I just don't know if Florida State can find enough sustainable offense to complement uh, some big plays that it will make. It's proven that it can make them, uh, but uh, I'm going to go with Clemson close. Mark? Yeah, I think, you, like I said before, this far into the season, you are who you are, and Clemson's an elite defensive front, front seven. Um you know, our defensive line is struggling with injuries. Um, is Cooper – I mean, I don't even know the status of Cooper. Do we know? Uh, I'm assuming he's playing. Yeah, I'm assuming – but he's not 100% and who isn't. So we're way into our depth on the defensive line, and that is a concern. Um, offensive line matchup against this defensive front um, is, is w- as much improved as, as we are up front – um, to, to sustain, uh, you know, not 60 minutes of, of football against these guys and, and think we're going to, you know, not dominate, but, but you know, be, be effective and, and control large parts of the game. I just don't see it. I think we'll have our moments. I think, we'll, like you said, Pat, I think we'll have some big plays. I think we'll, we'll, we may actually have a drive or two, but to sustain it over 60 minutes against this front is just unrealistic. Um, I'm hopeful you know, look, if they play it, they're going to they're gonna have to play their best game. They're going to have to play without penalties. They're going to have to, you know, play without turnovers. And these last two weeks, we haven't done it. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I hate – I can't even do it. Yeah. I can't even, I can't even do it. It's hard. Hey, listen, and here's the thing. Uh, this is not an unbeatable Clemson team, and I'm not sure they're not overranked. I think we probably all agree that they – to some degree might be a little bit overranked. Uh, you know, they're a top 10 team. I'm not sure they're the fourth or fifth best team in the country right now, but, and I usually don't do year to year type comparisons, but I do think there are enough of Florida state players back from last year. Remember that they did have some success against Clemson in that game. And we're very close uh, at, you know, to being in that game late in the fourth quarter. So uh, I'm not going to say there's a tremendous amount of carry for that game, but I do think some of the guys that, played in that game were probably more confident having had that experience than had they not. Screw it. You know what? I'm going 
FSU has got second and eight on the 22 with two timeouts left. They're going to run it twice. <laughs> Brian Fitzgerald's going to kick a field goal. We went 31-28. There you go. Well, we got a Florida State pick, folks. Woo! All right. All right. There you go. So I'm, glad, I, I, I'm glad my well, I walk back in time got Mark motivated for the FSU. Dude, pick. I feel yeah, like right. I feel for Mark, man. Like that just – he he has a True. big weight off his back, man. He yeah. feels so much better. I do. Well, that's good. Well, listen. Simple, whatever he was drinking – that's got to be some good moonshine, brother. This would not be a dominating to FSU win it. So send right, me we'll, some of that moonshine, Mark. You know what? We'll, we'll see next week. We'll see. <laughs> the power of persuasion, JP. It's the power of persuasion. I took, rolled it all the way back. I'm going to speak it alcohol. into existence. That's right. I'm going to speak it into existence, baby. Uh, yeah, that's right. Believe your words. Believe your words, Mark. All right, guys. Uh, we appreciate it. These got these things have been so much fun to do this year, uh, in large part because of you guys, obviously, and then uh, another part because of this uh, very entertaining football team Florida State has put on the uh, uh, field that's given us plenty to talk about each week, and I'm sure we will have plenty to talk about uh, next week. But, guys, thanks for joining me. And, uh, Mark, uh, roll us out of here. Hey, go Knowles, baby.